and, and thank you for having me in this panel. Uh, I would like to start with you know talking about uh, uh, the first generation learner, which is uh, which are coming to the higher education now. The B school, if you look at your classroom around, you will find that most of them are coming from tier two and tier three cities. The kind of business schools we are talking about, basically. Uh, and this is all, you know, because the access to higher education have, have increased over time. The GER is increasing and, you know, access to higher education because of the bank loans, uh, easy availability of bank loans, et cetera, have increased. So, you know, the, there is a difference between uh, the first generation learner and the second generation. I mean, as a teacher, uh, you know, I would like to understand that gender, that, that, that difference first uh, in order to approach learning, how we approach learning, how they approach learning, you know, uh, in fact, and how we teach. Uh, so the first generation learners, they don't have uh, that background uh, of, of uh, they're, they're coming from that kind of background where they have seen the practice of learning at home, while the second generation don't have that. Kind of. So when they come to us and when they ask them to read uh, 50 pages over, over overnight and come, come to the class, uh, it's such a big problem for them because they question this question, uh, they'll question you why, why you are asking us to read 50 pages. What is the fun in reading 50 pages? you know something something like that so their their, their learning style and their, the way they approach learning is very different from these the second generation learner uh, and what is the what is the number of uh, first generation learner in our class so in in our estimation in, in one of the research which i have conducted it's almost like 60 percent and it's a very staggering number so you know, how you approach them uh, in learning is is what determines the employability so in my view employability is is a learning gap problem uh, you know, we may think that the employability can be can can be overcome through several training programs and uh, X training or Y training or Z training. Uh, it's, it's largely a learning gap issue because if the students are not learning, how can they be employable? So at the end of the day, I have seen many industry personnel who will give the feedback that, uh, you know, the student have appeared for a certain job profile and even the basic questions uh, which are textbook questions are not being answered by them so you know there is a huge learning gap uh, and therefore in my opinion what we teach is more important is important of course but how we teach is even more important and this is one area which is largely neglected in business school because in business school you have faculty coming from basic discipline like psychology uh, you know many of them will be mba of course but Basically, they will come from economics, psychology, and uh, you know other other basic discipline. So they are very good in their discipline. But do they really know how students learn? So learnability, you know, how how they can pass on the teaching uh, or make make teaching converted into the learning for the students is uh, a ped pedagogical innovation uh, that is missing. And I totally agree with Dr. Parulekar when he said that you know uh, the teaching hours has to be reduced. What what I mean to say. Uh, over here is that you know you look at how you and I have learned in our life. It's almost about eighty percent of what we have learned in our life is outside the classroom. There's about thirty percent probably we would have would have learned in the classroom. And therefore, if you look at the allocation of time, typical allocation of time in a business school or any educational institution for that matter, um, the allocation is other way around. You know, we focus eighty percent inside the classroom. Is about twenty percent. If you are a very good, good progressive business school, you will focus twenty percent outside the classroom. It has to be other way around. You know, so, you know, you have to change this whole paradigm. And therefore, there comes the question of, you know, connecting with the society, connecting with the industry. So business school is not the classroom stop because learning have already put on their wings and it has flown out of the classroom. So, you know, any business school which is going to focus on the wider space of learning, like marketplace can be a learning place. Uh, industry is a learning place. Uh, cafeteria is a learning place. Open green grass lawn is a learning place. Uh, any place that you know, even the even the corridor can be. You know, gossip has been adopted as one of the strong medium of learning uh, for the students. These are informal, uh, anonymous uh, way of supplementing learning. So these are not recorded uh, format of learning, but you know, we call it informal way of approaching learning. But these are very powerful medium of learning. Um, and these days, most of the anonymity is affecting our life. You can see that many of the anonymity, th anonymous things that is affecting our life is, is so powerful uh, and they are actually affecting our life. So one of the things that I would like to emphasize in, is that, you know, how we make impact and how we connect with the society is more important. So there is a difference between, you know, we have to differentiate between output and the outcome. And that's how typically being done. Uh, at the international accreditation and others. So we have to focus more on the outcome 
uh, you know, outcome means uh, when the changes changes are happening because of your action, and it's it's, 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 it's basically talking about the action learning and connecting with the society. Uh, so you learn by doing. You learn by you know, uh, and we call it active learning. So the more of active learning uh, you, uh, you you incorporate in your in your curriculum, uh, the better your student becomes and the be better employable they become. Uh, so that's that's the key. Uh, and therefore, uh, I also agree with Dr. Parlekar when he said that the purpose of education is not just uh, giving them employability, but of course, employability is one plank we have to work on. Uh, but employability is intricately related to how we teach the students and how we fill this learning gap as well. So teacher's training is very important. Uh, uh, and any business school, I've seen many business schools who have focused on the teacher training on pedagogy, they have done exceedingly well. So, you know, we have the intrinsic value of education. There's something called the intrinsic value of education that has to be offered to the students in terms of lifelong learner, making them lifelong learner and making them active learner or making them uh, uh, increasing their learnability uh, but we, what we focus more is on the instrumental values, uh, like giving them few training here and there and make them get the first job. So that's the mismatch that we can see over here. So yes. that's, that's, that's the initial comment I would like to make. And I would like to come to our um, uh, Dr. Pankaj, you know, we are talking so much about expectation and aspirations. How can we manage this among students, especially when we're dealing with tier two, tier three cities? Yeah, absolutely. So we can't deny the fact that there is something called return on investment because a business school, if they're, they're opting to join business school spending 25 lakhs, they, they are investing money. So, you know, we have less agree that, you know, they are investing when they're taking a loan from bank and, you know, they are investing money. So they're looking for uh, return on investment. And if you look at the World Economic Forum report, uh, it talks about the lost generation, the inability of the a higher education institution to adapt or change their curriculum and the pedagogy has resulted into the cost meted out on the parents and the students. And uh, if you add up these costs over last 20 years down the line, the total cost is actually even more than the, the financial crisis. So who is responsible for this cost? Well, we have to agree to the fact that there is a difference between when a teacher is teaching the teamwork in the classroom uh, through theory and textbook it doesn't make the student necessarily a good team worker. You know, that is, let us understand the fact that when the teacher is saying that reading is important, it also requires that the teacher must be a good reader. Because if you yourself is not a good reader and you expect the student to read, to read, you know, it, it's not good. It's unlikely to work. I have seen, uh, you, you put five, five teachers on a job, they'll start fighting with each other. Teamwork is not there among themselves. And they think that the teamwork can be taught in the classroom. So that's the problem. So that's, that's why I'm saying learnability, learnability on both sides. Leading by example is missing in our institution. And it is the responsibility of the educational institution to look into that. We know economics, we know physics, we know chemistry, we know management. But do we know really how learning works? Do we really know how to work in team? Do we really know, you know how to show the sufficient example to the first generation learners, especially large in number in your classroom? Because they learn by looking at what you are doing. People actually learn by watching and seeing rather than listening. So, you know, uh, you know, very well goes the Bloom's taxonomy. You, you all know about it. So where are the practices? Where are the practices? This is one aspect that we have to build in. And that's the responsibility of the education institution. So how, the, the question on how. So I will give you just one example what what we are doing. Uh, our basic premise of learning is that learning can happen to anybody or anyone can learn. It doesn't have to be like, you know, students have to filter down to make or call him, call him a learner. Everybody entering into your institution is a learner. And you have to look at them. The last student in your classroom is a learner. And anybody can learn. It's about the conditions of learning. Now, these conditions of learning, if you provide those conditions of learning, students will learn. And who provides the conditions of learning is the faculty's job. So question is that our faculty trained enough to know what are those conditions of learning wherein the students will learn. That's number one. Number two, all learners are not the same. So you have to understand uh, the learners very carefully. So all of them are not at the... So if you think that one solution is going to fit all and you go to the classroom and deliver a lecture, come back, you think the students have been prepared for the industry is wrong. It, is, it may not happen that way. So you have to understand each one of these students sitting in the class. So we... 
So, you know, we have initiated something called the individual development plan. So we do it this IDP when they come to us. So with a two weeks uh, elaborate, uh, you know, uh, induction program where we focus mostly on the learning approaches and styles, the expectation setting, uh, the campus immersion, talking about values, mission uh, and habits and things like that. Uh, and then we talk about individual development. So individual development plans where the alumni uh, will sit with a student and an industry professional will sit with a student and a faculty mentor will sit with a student. So these will form a group and individually they will talk about, uh, you know, the expectations of the students. So if students will express their expectations through a conversation. So one of the questions that we are going to ask, or we ask them is that, where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, why have you joined almost us? like a job interview before yeah. for the university yeah kind of kind of you know uh, uh, why have you joined business school uh, which companies are you aiming at for your job what are your competencies what are you good at you know things like that so that sets a lot of expectations uh, right there uh, absolutely it kind of has to match the expectation with industry it's a written it's a written document so along with the industry this this has been worked out uh, a lot of suggestions are also given to them uh, by the industry people at that point of time and this is the first round we do and second round we do after the summer internship is is over so that is about the second year when they enter the second year the fourth trimester so that is the second round so we take a review of what has happened to their goals expectations and there is something called also something called uh, you know uh, dream clause that we give to the students say for example uh, they might mismatch about their expectations it had it can happen with anybody so you know suppose somebody wanted to uh, aim at certain company or certain profile which um, one way or the other could not get through uh, and got us got another job because you know they have to have a job because they have financial liability so at least one job has to be there in the hand so we allow the student to have that job in the hand and later on if they get the opportunity, they can still exercise a dream clause and and keep on appearing for those companies which they actually originally uh, thought of. So yes, that way, those, you know, are, yeah. Yeah. those things need to be in place to make sure that, you know, their expectations are also met, but their opportunities are also open. So that in case their expectations exactly. are not met, they can always go for exactly. other things. Basta, basta just one uh, point I would yes, like to emphasize over here is the is the culture that we build in the campus is very important. And culture does not mean the culture has to be only from the student side. It has to be from the faculty side. It has to be from the director side. It has to be from everybody in the campus altogether. So anything that you actually feel is a part of culture or value has to be followed by everybody. So leading by example, is very important these days because unless that happens uh, you know the kind of uh, expectation that we ha we have about the young generations cannot be fulfilled so that's the point i would like to make. thank you so much and you're absolutely right reading leading by example setting expectations and also setting um, you know your goals as an institution outright is important it seems that the reputation of an mba university and the colleges um are so uh, blown out that you know we need to bring it back to reality you need to you know set the goals of academics about back on back to people and remind them that what they're actually coming to um, uh, university for. Thank you so much panelists for coming here today.